Hello, and welcome to the meeting. This meeting is now being recorded. Hello, and welcome to the Dog Show Mentor Interview of Jonathan David. Today, we host a man who has been traveling worldwide, presenting seminars and lectures, as well as being a Beaver breeder. Beaver Terrier. <laughs> Beaver Terrier breeder. Thank you. He's a world renowned speaker and commentator on American TV shows such as Dogs 101, Animal Planet, Good Morning America, and The View. He lectures and seminars around the world. In fact, I met Jonathan in Korea at a dog show I was judging. And he's also a grooming contest judge who does show trimming and he owns his own pet grooming spa called the Lap of Luxury Dog Spa, which is the most unique pet boutique of its kind in South Florida. Jonathan is partnered with Kenshi Shears, the industry leader in high quality grooming shears. And that company is, by the way, owned by some dog show people who have Danes and other working breeds. Kenshi has created their, his, their own line um, just for Jonathan called The Lightning. Jonathan has many educational DVDs and has some YouTube videos as well, which you can go and see when this is over and see how um, dynamic he is in speaking. So welcome, Jonathan. I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Lee. It's my pleasure to be here again. Um, so in the first part of this series, we did um, an education about the manuf well, the, the metals used in creating shears and the different handles and edges so that people had an understanding. And that's in part one. So if you missed that, make sure you go back and watch that um, because it explains everything about the different types of processes for making shears, which were, we went over the cast versus forge, the liquid metal poured into a mold versus the handmade, which affects the price because the quality is higher the edges are going to last longer and you can achieve a much higher quality shear. Um, so after we went over all that, the second part of this is basically going to be about um, how to care for your shears, how to make sure that they are adjusted properly, and just kind of go over the actual manufacturing process of the higher end shears. Um, so we're going to start with sharpening and maintenance. Um, this is something that I get asked about a lot when I go to grooming shows and when I do seminars. Um, people ask me, well, how often do you sharpen your shears? And there's really no simple answer to that because it really matters how often you use them, what type of grooming you're doing with them, what type of an edge they have, what kind of metals they're made out of, and who you're using for sharpening. So let me break those down for you so there's a little bit of a better understanding of that. So obviously, in the first part, we went over the different hardnesses of metals. So if you have some of your harder metals, then it's going to be less sharpening in between, uh, less, uh, more time in between sharpenings that you can use the shear because the harder metals will last a little longer. But if you're using one of your really fine finishing work shears, like your convex edge shears, to cut through bulky or dirty hair, um, or carve out coat, they may dull a little more quickly, so you're going to have to have them sharpen a little bit more often. And I really can't stress to you how important it is to make sure that you find a high quality sharpener to do your shears because, as I had said earlier, you don't want to send your grooming shears to somebody who does kitchen cutlery or household scissors because that is a very, very different type of sharpening. Uh, than the type of sharpening we do on fine tools for cutting hair. Um, fine tools for cutting hair are sharpened with something called a diamond wheel, um, and the, the sharpeners are skilled tradesmen, um, or they should be, and they really can look at your shears and know what type of an edge they're supposed to have on them and put the different types of bevel, semi-convex, and convex edge. 
And I actually have had bad experiences with sharpeners who didn't really know what they were doing and they've ruined a pair of my shears. And, you know, to go out and spend a couple hundred dollars on a high quality shears to groom one of your prize show dogs and then have somebody ruin it in one shot can be a really heavy blow. So make sure that you do find a high quality sharpener who has experience doing Japanese scissors or shears. And um, I always recommend if you can't find somebody in your area that is definitely high quality sharpener, send it back to the manufacturer. You know, almost every manufacturer of high quality shears that I know of, they do sharpening themselves. So at Kenji, we, we take shears back and we sharpen them. We do a service and um, I always recommend sending it to the manufacturer of the shears because obviously they made it so they know how to sharpen them. So it's really important. I had discussed in, in, in the first part that I have some of my shears that I use as my everyday shears for grooming that were my shears back when I was doing grooming competitions. And I have some of them that are 11 and 12 years old and they're still in good condition. They've got a lot of life left to them because I take good care of them. And this is the key to having longevity in your shears. So sharpening and maintenance is really important. If you ever get any kind of nicks in the edge of your shear, whether it be from a dropping, banging them together, you pinch the comb with your scissor or what have you, if you have a nick, put the scissors away and use your backup pair and have those sharpened because it's kind of like the crack in a windshield. If a rock hits your windshield and makes a little tiny half an inch crack in your windshield and you continue driving with every bump, that little crack goes a little bit wider and further and eventually you've got this spider web crack across your windshield. Same thing happens with a nick on a scissor. If you've got a small nick and you continue opening and closing that scissor, what started as a little tiny nick that might be an easy, easy repair could turn into a huge nick that they then have to ground down, grind down a huge portion of your scissors and you're going to lose part of the overall extended life of your shear. Um, so that's really important that you make sure that you know what you're doing when you send it to somebody for sharpening and you don't use shears that have nicks in them. Also keeping them oiled and cleaned. So it's really important to keep your shears oiled just as you would any other type of machinery because metal does dry out. And there is an assembly which we're going to get into in, in, a, in a little bit. The assembly is the little screw that holds your scissors together. And as you cut hair, little snippets of hair migrate into that assembly. And as those little snippets of hair work their way into the threads of the screw that holds your scissors together, it's going to cake that up with gunk and dirt and debris and oil. And eventually what happens is it starts to unscrew and it doesn't hold your scissors together as well anymore. And you're going to constantly be adjusting the tension. So it's really important that you keep them clean and oiled. And it's very simple. All shears come, well, higher quality shears, come with a, a, a little um, oil tube. And every day, now this is going for a groomer who uses them every day, but if you're using them infrequently, at, at the start of each use, you, put, you open your scissors and you simply put one drop of oil in between the two blades and you let it you open and close the scissor and you move the scissor around to get that oil to move to the center and then just take a little tissue or cloth and wipe off the excess oil. And what this does is it keeps your pivot point, your screw called the assembly, in good working condition and keeps all debris and dirt off the threads of the screw. It's really important to do that on a regular basis and keep your shears oiled. Um, and you only need to put it right there at the assembly. You don't like to get oil on the outside edges of your shear because what it'll do is it's going to dull the polish and they're not going to look as nice. It won't hurt the function of the shear. Um, but always use scissor oil or clipper oil. You don't want to use, I've heard some very crazy things through the years. People have told me they use lip balm and WD-40. WD-40 will actually strip the finish off of your shears. Do not use that. Don't use lip balm because scissors are scissors. They are not lips. You don't want to use a waxy material. You want to use something that is created for scissors and for metal, which is scissor or clipper oil. Um, so that, that's really important. And just wipe off any excess and you're ready to start um, you know, your grooming process. So let's move on. And 
I want to talk about t checking the tension and adjustment. So this is one of the biggest reasons why scissors become dull. If you do not have your scissors tight enough and the blades bang together, or if you have them too tight and you're forcing the blades to grind against one another, you are going to dull your blade and create little nicks in the blade. Um, and also over time, if you have scissors that are too tight and you're using them on a regular basis, you can cause fatigue in your wrist. And if you're a groomer, you can actually uh, develop some of your problems that, that some people do with their wrists, such as carpal tunnel syndrome or tendinitis. So the best way to hold uh, the scissors to check the tension is you hold the side that has the thumb hole, okay, that's opposite of the side with the pinky rest, and you hold the scissor up and down um, in a, um, uh, with the points sticking straight up and the finger holes facing the floor. And you're going to hold the, the, the one side with the finger hole and you're going to pull the pinky rest out to the side and release it. If the scissor closes and hits the other side, it's too loose. So you're going to want to adjust the tension. And we're going to get into how to do that in a moment. But you're going to want to adjust the tension so that it doesn't close all the way. If you hold your, if you pull that pinky rest all the way out and you let it go and it doesn't move and it stays all the way up in the air, your scissors are too tight. So you want to loosen it a little bit so that they close just before hitting the opposite side. So the proper tension is you hold the finger hole, you, you hold the thumb hole, you pull the pinky rest up to the side, release it, and you want it to close and just stop about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch before hitting the opposite side. That's how you check your tension. This is the optimum um, tension for performance of the shear and best for your hand. Okay, so I wanna show you the, the uh, assemblies of the different shears on the next slide. So there's two basic assemblies, okay? Now the first one is called an internal tension dial assembly. Now you'll see some shears have decorative um, decals on, on one side. And in Kenshi, we give each of our shears a name. So we do generally a picture that kind of goes along with it. So you can see in the picture there, there's one called the Viper and we put a little snake head on it. The other one is called the Flame and we've got a flame. Uh, the Evolutions have a blue stone in it. Those basically are just decoration, okay? They do not have a function other than decoration. When you flip that over, you will see a little screw, okay? Like the, the um, basically like, the, like what a flathead screwdriver goes into. There's a little slot. But instead of it being one long line, you're going to see two little notches. And each one of these types of shears comes with this small round metal disc with little um, teeth on the outside kind of looks like one of those, you know, little Chinese stars, um, you know, you would see in the, in the, the Kung Fu movies, but it's basically a, 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 a tool and you stick two of those teeth into that screw and you turn um, to tighten it or loosen it. And it's the, you know, the old rule, lefty loosey, righty tighty. So if you go right, it's going to tighten it a little bit. If you click it to the left, it's going to go loose. And generally you can feel each click. So you just have to do one at a time. And this is called an internal uh, tension dial assembly. So what that is, is there's a screw inside there. You never take your scissors apart. That is absolutely only for a scissor sharpener to do because there are very small, fine working parts in there. There are little screws, little teeny tiny washers that if you were to uh, unscrew your scissors and the, they came apart on the table, that little washer, could just roll away without you even noticing. They're almost translucent, little clear washers. And if you don't have that washer back in there when you put that scissor back together, your scissors will not function. So leave that to the professional. So that's called an internal tension dial. Um, now we're gonna move on to the external, and that is called um, the external uh, dial assembly. And some people call that a ball assembly. And basically what that is, it's the same thing, there's a screw inside that um, holds the scissors together, but instead of having that little disc tool that comes with it that you put in like a screwdriver, this is actually a knob on the outside, and you can turn the actual knob to the left or to the right, 
uh, to make it tighter or looser. Now, there's no advantage to internal or external other than ease of, of tightening, but some people like the decorations of the other style, so that's why we do both. Um, mine happened to be, uh, my, my personal line was called Lightning, and I wanted a lightning bolt. And the reason I came up with that design is because I'm known for scissoring very fast. So I figured I scissor lightning fast, I should have lightning shears. So I wanted that cool little lightning bolt design. So mine has an internal tension dial, but I certainly do have external dial assemblies on many of my scissors. And these are constructed a little bit different. If you look at the pictures, you're gonna see the dial, which is the knob that turns left and right. And then you're gonna see a little plate, you know, it's sort of an uh, elongated metal plate. And that is the spring tension. And that fits on the scissor. And as you tighten that, that little spring plate gets tighter and flush up against the scissor and it pulls the scissors closer together. So you maintain these the same way as I was describing before. You open and close them, put a little drop of oil under the assembly, uh, let it migrate to the center and wipe off any excess. Um, so those are going to be your two uh, assemblies that you're always going to see, either an internal dial assembly or an external dial assembly. Um, and those are the only two. There's no other assemblies. And um, like I said, there's no advantage or disadvantage to one or the other. It's just different uh, design feature. So now let's go into the anatomy of the shear. And this is going to be basically um, all of the terminology so that you better understand exactly what it is. Um, first, I'd like to start, if you look at the lower left corner, as I was discussing before about don't take your shears apart, if you can look at all those working parts just to that uh, assembly to hold that scissor together, you can see that there's the dial adjuster, there's a tension plate, there's a washer, a ball bearing, there's the screw. If you lose any one of those single little parts, and when I tell you on some of these shears that they are small, I'm talking a teeny tiny little washer. So you certainly don't want to lose those, uh, and you certainly don't want to take those apart. So looking at the picture of the shears, you've got your blades. Um, the inside area of the blade is called the hollow ground. Your tips and the inside edge. Your assembly is what holds them together. Your back ride is part of the shank. That is the portion of metal between the assembly and the finger holes. You've got your finger hole, your thumb hole, your uh, finger rest or the pinky rest. And then you've got, if you look at that little rubber piece between the two finger holes and it's called a bumper. Now the bumper is very important because the bumper is a little rubber piece and it can be adjusted and that keeps your metal finger holes from clanking together but it also keeps your tips in line. Now bumpers do wear out and bumpers can be replaced and they do need to be replaced. They are a shock absorber. That's why they're not made of metal. As you open and close your scissors the bumper absorbs a lot of the shock. So if your bumper starts to flatten or wear out, you'll notice that your tips will start to cross. If that happens, you need to replace the bumper. Do not continue using your shears if your bumper has been worn out. When you cross your tips over, number one, you're gonna cause grinding and you may dull your shear. And number two, you're not gonna get the right kind of a cut that the shear was designed for. So those are your, that's your basic terminology. And now I'm going to explain to you how shears are actually made. This is how high-end shears are actually manufactured. So as I was talking earlier about the different types, when I spoke in, in session one, in part one, about the manufacturing of shears, your very inexpensive cheap shears are going to be made through liquid metal poured into a mold, and then they're screwed together, and they're put into a little package, and they're shipped off. Those are typically done in a factory. Um, and there's no real skill to it. There's no design, there's no hand uh, work on them. If you see how higher end shears are made, this is how it starts out. They blend the alloys and they create a steel sample. So it's a sheet of metal. Then on a computer, they design the actual parts of the scissor. Now mind you, with high end shears, okay, your blades, your shanks, and your finger holes are all made separately. So it's three parts, and then they weld the three parts together. And the reason for that is if you do drop your shears, if your shears get damaged in some way and they get bent and they're no longer lining up, 
as long as they have been made in this process, they have a little bit of ply, uh, pliability. So they, they, can, uh, they can actually be slightly bent back into shape without snapping. If they have been poured into a mold, and those are called cast shears, they have no ability to be bent back into shape. So your shears get bent or damaged and the sharpener needs to rebalance them um, they can't with that type of shear because it can actually snap. So that's another advantage to this. So after they're designed on the computer, they go into a machine and the computer design is then cut out with a wire and they cut out the working parts and then they weld those three parts together, your blade, your shank, and your finger holes. After they're welded, they go in for grinding, okay? and they actually grind down any of the pieces of metal that are sticking out, they smooth it out. After it's ground, they go for hollow grinding, and hollow grinding is what starts to give them um, the, the flat center on the, on the inside of the edges of the blades. Um, then they are put into an oven for a heat treatment, and that is where um, the, uh, the finishes are put on. So if you want, the shears to be pink or black or to have an iridescent color, that's where the titanium coating will be put on. Or if you want that glossy silver look of a, of a, a shear, that real shiny stainless steel, that's done during the heat treatment. After they come out of the heat treatment, they are polished by hand. And then after polishing, they go for what's called flattening. And that's where the real skill comes in. This is where the craftsman part of it comes in. And this skill is a very old school, um, it's a, a, a dying art form, but there are still many people um, who do them. Uh, most of our shears are manufactured in, in Asia. Um, this is where they actually look for uh, the balance of the shear and they use tools to flatten, they hammer it out. Um, and then after it is um, hammered and, and flattened into the proper proportions, then they go for sharpening and they add the hone line. The hone line is opposite of the blade and it guides your blade against the metal. And then once that's done, they are assembled and they are put together for final inspection. And um, they are inspected at the, um, at the uh, manufacturing facility. And then when they come to Kenchi, every pair, every single pair, and we, we sell thousands and thousands of pairs, every single pair is taken out of the box. It is tested. If they're not sharp enough, they're resharpened, uh, and they're actually tested on hair just to make sure that they are cutting uh, so that there's no uh, scissors that go out to anybody that are not in perfect condition. So they get uh, that final inspection by the uh, staff at the Kenshi warehouse in Atlanta, Georgia. So there are many hands that it's going through before it goes into the box to be sold. Um, and as you can see, that whole process is a lengthy, detailed process, and it's not the same as uh, your cheap uh, liquid poured scissors, the same kind that they um, make household shears um, out of. So it, it, is, it is a skilled art form. And um, that's how that's how your high end scissors are made. Um, you know, at I am very proud and very pleased to be associated with a company like Kenshi. Um, and I have learned so much in my few years of of working with them. And I've learned so much about scissors and the different manufacturing processes and. Um, the different facets of procedures that go into making a quality shear. And if you speak to some of your, your high-end groomers or your, your competitive groomers, and a lot of those groomers are handlers, a lot of our top competitors in the grooming circuit, and there's this very competitive grooming circuit uh, that goes on, and, and a lot of your top competitors are also owner handlers. Um, <clears throat> They, they breed and show poodles and bichons and uh, terriers and sporting breeds. I mean, we've got experts in every, every corner of the dog world that are out uh, competing, and they will tell you that part of the winning edge is having those higher quality shears. And there are competitors 
who keep a set of shears just for their dog shows or just for their grooming competitions. Um, so it really does does make a difference in the long run. Um, you know, at, at Kenshi, we say we're not your average brand. It's Kenshi um, because that's the truth. And it holds true for a lot of your scissor companies that are higher end and that put this kind of time and quality into the shears. And um, if you're a dog show person, if you're learning about grooming, um, whatever found your, how, for whatever reason you found your way to, to listening to these seminars and learning from, from Lee's speakers, um, I really encourage you to, you know, if you breed one particular breed and you're good at that breed, try a grooming competition. It's fun and it really helps uh, develop your skills. Um, we do see a lot of professional handlers and owner handlers coming over into the grooming competition world. And we have a lot of people who started out in the grooming competition world and learned about dog showing and crossed over into dog showing. It's a very interconnected, intermingled world um, that should go hand in hand more than it does. And um, you're gonna start seeing that. Um, one of our major companies that does shows, grooming shows, Barkley, has started to partner with AKC to bring some grooming events to some AKC shows. Um, and if you're someone who does go to dog shows, I'm sure you've seen many scissor vendors there um, who a lot of them do know about the different shears and they can help educate you. But now you can take this knowledge that you've learned here and you can go there and you're a more informed buyer and you know what you need to buy instead of somebody talking you into buying what you need. So that's, that's what I have to offer you with this seminar. And I, I really hope that all of the information provided in parts one and parts two of um, secrets to your scissoring and, and how to scissor and how to choose a scissor, I really hope this helps you and helps develop your skills for grooming your breed or multiple breeds and hopefully will give you that winning edge. Jonathan, thank you so much. I know that I've learned a lot. I didn't realize what the difference was between the $20 brand, uh, kind of scissors or shears and the $300. I knew there was something, some little magic, but I didn't, wasn't sure what it was. Um, I think key here is that if you really want to be competitive, you have to invest in your equipment, your tools, and then you have to be trained. And of course, that's part of what you do also. So um, Dog Show Mentor members, uh, look Jonathan up on, uh, on the web and on YouTube and look for his uh, DVDs. They're really uh, very informative. And I just wanna thank you so much for taking the time to be here, Jonathan. It was really a pleasure. And it was my pleasure to be here. And I, I love what I do and I love passing on the knowledge that I've been fortunate enough, really blessed to, to learn from people all over the world. And so to be able to pass that on to people in any little way is, is I feel, my, my duty and my obligation. So thank you for having me. Bye-bye now.